Hello and welcome to another fun-filled edition of Adam's Music Box, where uh, today I want to talk about yet more posthumous Jimi Hendrix songs that are set for release. This time, no fewer than 38 songs are set for release, featuring, of course, experienced drummer Mitch Mitchell and Bill Cox playing the bass instead of Noel Redding. And I'm sure the music will be good, but at one point, at what point is enough enough when it comes to milking the posthumous cash cow that is the unexplored or unheard or reconstructed recordings of Jimi Hendrix? And this doesn't just apply to Jimi Hendrix. It really applies to almost any artist who died at an age younger than that which we would have liked or have expected. And at, at one point, I get it. When someone dies in their prime or someone dies when they clearly have more musical statements to make, there's an urge among the public to try to hypothesize about what could have been, what would have come next. And the way that people who own the master tapes of various unreleased pieces of music or demos or things that are reconstructed, let's say, you know, one bar of a guitar on loop tape and you have other session musicians brought in to play behind him these are all things that will necessarily get an get an audience curious at one time but i just don't know if i find it to be in good taste i find something very odd about releasing music against the will of an artist and don't get me wrong this happens a lot of time when artists are alive but at least when you're alive you have the ability to sue the person releasing something against your will or at minimum to go onto social media or a radio show or whatever and and, and call them out say that this label or this person is releasing something that i didn't approve of, boycott it, it's unofficial, etc. Alan Holdsworth's uh, first album, for instance, he felt that about that, he felt that way about it, say that three times fast, and he made those thoughts very well known, the Velvet Darkness album, he told people don't buy it, it's not official, it's not something of which I approve. Was I mean the record label did, according to Holdsworth, who was very, very self-critical. But getting back to this whole posthumous release thing, um, Hendrix is probably the artist where there have been many more, I would say exponentially more records of his music released since his death than there were during his lifetime. And some of the stuff was stuff that was totally mixed and mastered and ready to go. Some of it was live performances, demos, bootlegs, some of it has had to have been reconstructed. And again, I'm as guilty as anyone of really liking some of those early posthumous albums that were released in the very early 70s, mainly because a lot of the stuff there was stuff that was polished, recorded, mastered, finalized, and would have been good to go on an album. But there needs to be a point where you say that this has crossed the line between a tasteful expose that lets audiences hear the polished works recorded in the lifetime of an artist but not released and now here they are presented to you in an official release after the artist's lifetime there comes a point where it just becomes a game of how much money can we make we, we whoever it is whether it's the heirs whether it's a record label whether it's lawyers no matter who it is it becomes really vulgar and really distasteful i mean with Zappa, for instance, I think that's gone on for far too long because Zappa was very hands-on and very particular about what he wanted released and the way he wanted it released and how he wanted it to sound in terms of the mixing and mastering. And I think that it's pr it's gone on quite long enough in terms of the Zappa estate releasing now so much stuff so much stuff, whether it's live or otherwise, and in Zappa's case, a lot of it is live, that he didn't release in his lifetime, even though as someone who meticulously cataloged all of his stuff, he would have known where it was in his library and what it was, and he didn't release it for a, for a reason. And I think especially with someone as strongly opinionated as Zappa, you've kind of got to respect that. And that respect has all but been lost, I think, with Jimi Hendrix. I think that rather than just appreciating the legend and what he did do in his lifetime, I think that 
they've gone too far. Um, then we get to the issue of Van Halen, where luckily it seems that for now at least, Alex Van Halen and Wolf Van Halen, Eddie's son, haven't been rushing to release unreleased archives from the 5150 studios um, all, too, all too quickly. And I actually think that's a good thing. Uh, on the various box sets and deluxe editions that have come out, they've mainly released rare things that were already officially released. The B-sides of singles, uh, things that the guys did for movie soundtracks that didn't appear on albums. And that, I think, is totally fine and totally tasteful because this is stuff that was released officially in the lifetime of the artist, but done outside of the traditional album format. I think that's absolutely fine. And I hope, frankly, that they respect Eddie's archives. Because again, much like Zappa, Eddie was very particular about what he did and didn't release. If he didn't want something released, I think that we should respect those wishes and suppress our own curiosity, suppress our own fandom, and say, look, respect a person who released what he wanted when he wanted. There are, of course, some, some instances where very respectful posthumous albums are released by the people that worked with an artist and knew them best. One of my favorite examples of this is the album Love, L Love Lives Forever by the great Minnie Riperton. We did a video about her on this channel fairly recently. Her vocals were recorded in 78, and then after her death in 1980, some of the musicians very close to her heart um, added backing vocals and instrumentation. And these were people that she worked with in her lifetime. Then there was the posthumous Queen album, Made in Heaven, where existing tracks by Freddie were finished by the band that he had played with for 30 years. And that was, I think, tasteful as one final album so don't get me wrong when it's the one final album or in Hendrix's case maybe things like Rainbow Bridge, War Heroes, The Cry of Love those three I say okay fair enough but know when to stop know when enough is enough I think the people who are in charge of the Hendrix catalog have totally blown it the people who are in charge of the Zappa catalog have totally blown it the people in charge of the Frank Sinatra catalog, I think, have been very tasteful. They've mainly re-released singles and records and haven't dug too much into the B-sides and the unexplored things. The Beach Boys, I think, generally, uh, obviously, Brian Wilson is still alive, but he's not really in charge of his own affairs at the moment. In general, I think they've done well. But let me know what you think. Do you think that it's perfectly reasonable for every note that a dead musician has played uh, when he was alive, obviously? Do you think that all of that should be released? Or should we really consider what's tasteful and respectful to not only the wishes, but to the legacy of the musician who we've lost? Let me know what you think in the comments. Like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Take care.